Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our morning worship. I do hope everybody had a, a lovely Christmas yesterday. I'm not, I'm not, as you know, I'm not one for Christmas, but it, it was tolerable yesterday, I must admit. It was quite nice being down at the sister-in-law's and we're really spoiled. But it is good to be here this morning and to worship our Lord. I'll just go through a couple of the notices that we have. We've only got two for, for this week. Um, next Sunday morning, Steve will be leading our worship at 11 o'clock in the morning. And a slight change um, on the evening at 6 o'clock, we'll be meeting for a short time of prayer, those who can, just to pray in the new year. Um, and I think that's about all the notices for the coming week. I'm going to sing our first hymn now, number 714. And I hope we know this one, Megs assures us that we know the tune. So shall we rise and sing 714, please? Shall we pray? Father God, we thank you this morning for the privilege of coming into your very presence. We thank you, Lord, that you are the holy God, a just God. And Father, we can only come into your presence because of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done for us on the cross at Calvary. And Father God, as we celebrate the birth of Jesus this Christmas time, we realise how he was born in a lowly stable, how he humbled himself to be born in the form of a boy, to grow up as a man and to live a sinless life, to live a life that we could not live. And Father God, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. He's made all things possible with us that we might have a right relationship with you. And Father God, would pray this Christmas time, we would see through all the dross of the Western culture we live in. We'd see past all the things that dazzle us, the sights and the sounds and the Christmassy things, Lord, that we e so easily get sidetracked into, and we might see that you had a plan and a purpose for mankind, that the Lord Jesus Christ himself was going to fulfill that purpose on our behalf. And Father, we want to make much of Jesus this morning. We want to glorify his name, and we, want, we might want to honour you as well. So Father God, at the outset of this meeting, might your Holy Spirit come upon us, Lord, and lead us, Lord, and show us the things you want us to see this morning. Father, would you speak to our very hearts? Would you, the living God, speak to your sinful creatures? Father, we don't deserve this, but would you lead us now? In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We're going to sing again, this time number 1045, <coughs> all from Mission Praise this morning, from the squalor of a borrowed stable. 1045.
lifted on a plural cross. He was punished for a world transgression. He was suffered to save the lost. He fights for breath. He fights for me. Losing sinners from the chains of death. Through the shelters, souls are free. Death defeated the For those who are watching on live stream, I might just disappear off camera for a few minutes just to see what presents the kids have got. We've got three kids with us this morning. I haven't prepared a kid's talk, but I'll just go and ask them what they got for Christmas, if they don't mind. So can I ask you first, young lady, what's your name? Rosie. Rosie, what did you get, Rosie? Our first reading this morning is from Isaiah um, chapter 9, verses 1 to 7. If those who've got a Bible, you would like to turn to that, that would be great. Isaiah 9, verses 1 to 7. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divided the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle, tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts 
will do this. Amen. Shall we pray again? Father God, we thank you for your words in your book, Lord, that tell us of the Son, the, the one who is going to come to save his people, the Messiah. And Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. And the government shall be upon his, sh his shoulder. He shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And we can have our hope in and assurance in him. So, Father God, would you bless us this morning? Would you do us good as we meet around your word? And, Father, we do realise that this Christmas time, the light did come into the world, um, and it, it, it came through the darkness. But, Father God, there are many, even in our church this morning, in our nation, Lord, who, Christmas, is, who, who might, Christmas might not be a happy time. I know I don't like Christmas that much, but there are others who brings back really bad memories and they're lonely or they're sad at this time and father god we think of those people this morning lord but father above all we pray lord that your spirit might come upon us this morning your spirit might come upon this nation and father god that he might illuminate the lord jesus christ we might see him as savior in our lives and father god our prayer is that uh, boys and girls mums and dads adults everybody lord would turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and bow the knee and accept him as saviour in their lives. Father God, we realise there is no other way. We've got two choices to make. We either accept you or we reject you. And Father God, what might your Holy Spirit show us this morning that we need to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ. So be with us now in our meeting, Lord. Lead us by your spirit. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our next hymn. Here's number 337, In the Bleak Midwinter. Our main reading this morning is in Luke's Gospel, Luke um, chapter 2, and we're going to be reading verses 21 to 35. Luke chapter 2, verses 21 to 35. 
And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it, it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for the revelation of the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled that was about what was, what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the, falling, for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that, through, through, so that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Amen. We're going to be looking um, at this passage through sort of the eyes of Simeon. And I've given a title to this message, Resting in Jesus. And I think more so, particularly in the year that's just gone, where we've had, uh, the last 18 months, I should say, we've had COVID, um, we've had a lot of uncertainty, um, had a lot of turmoil in the political realm. Um, we're not quite sure what we're resting in, are we, in these days? But we're to be like Simeon, to rest in the Lord Jesus Christ. We can't really put our faith in the politicians, can we, in the scientists? And as we experienced here in Northumberland about um, oh, four or five weeks ago, we had the worst storm that I can remember in, my, in, in the history of my life. And it did hundreds of millions of pounds worth of damage in Northumberland. The devastation was immense. So we do live in uncertain times. So we need to rest in our Lord Jesus Christ. So when Jesus was born, it was a time of spiritual darkness. I'm sure we can resonate with this today. But there was hope for the faithful remnant, just like there is for us today, if we're in the Lord Jesus Christ. We read in Isaiah um, chapter 9, verse 2, that the people who dwell in deep darkness have seen a great light. Jesus was the light of the world who came in a time of darkness. The word of God was not amongst the people. God's word had been silent for many years. There was no prophetic message. The religious leaders in Jesus' time were corrupt and the people were under the oppressive rule of the Roman Empire. And even the birth of Jesus um, to a virgin before her marriage to Joseph would have been a disgrace in the society at the time. And we read, don't we, in the gospel, there was no room for the baby Jesus in the inn. And the baby had to be born in a stable, which was only fit for animals. So it was a time of darkness, wasn't it? And then we read in the gospel, King Herod was trying to kill the baby Jesus. So it was a dark time. But Christ came into the world to overcome the darkness. And he did that on our behalf. So Jesus brings us light and hope. And the whole purpose of these events in the temple or to show us that we need to rest in Jesus, just like Simeon did. Jesus has broken through our dark darkness and brought us into his wonderful light. Jesus needs to be the centre of our lives as we are joyfully obedient to him and follow him. Our hope is to be found in Jesus, not just in the here and now. Don't we? We live for the moment, don't we? We live for gratification, but our hope is to be in Jesus. I've divided this passage into four main headings. Um, the first one is the presentation of Jesus in the temple. And then we're going to look at the person of Simeon. We're going to look at Simeon's blessing. 
And we're going to look at what Simeon said to Mary and Joseph. And then finally, we look at a few points of application for us today. So the presentation of Jesus in the temple, and we read this in verses 21 to 24. So we pick up the story in verse 21, when Jesus was circumcised at eight days old, as was the custom. Now this was done according to the law, and we read about this in Leviticus verse, uh, chapter 12, verse 3. And it was a sign of God's everlasting covenant given, in, given to Abraham. God had a chosen people for himself, I read that in Genesis 17, verse 10. Jesus was now part of that covenant, and he was given his name at his circumcision ceremony. The name Jesus was not chosen by Mary or Joseph, but by the angel Gabriel. And Jesus means salvation, for he will save their people from their sins. And we read about that in Matthew 1, verses 21 to 22. So we see in these verses Mary and Joseph's obedience as devout Jews bringing the baby Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem to present him to God. And this would have been about after about 40 days after his birth. It would have been at the end of Mary's purification time. And we can read about that in Leviticus 12. She would now be able to come back into the temple after her days of purification. And Exodus 13 verse 2 tells us, that every firstborn male child belongs to the Lord. Remember the firstborn sons of the Egyptians died, but the firstborn of the Israelites lived when the angel of death passed over the land of Egypt. So the firstborn sons belonged to God. But what a firstborn son this child was to be. He truly belonged to God and would live a human life on our behalf in total obedience to his father trailblazing the way for our redemption, being totally obedient to his father and ultimately going to the cross and suffering a cruel death. So Jesus would live the perfect, obedient life on our behalf, a life that we could not live. He was sinless and only a sinless one could save us. And when we look at our salvation, we see that it was all done for us by the Lord Jesus Christ. We could not do it because of our sin, but it's a free gift of grace from God. We can't work for our salvation no matter how we try. And many people spend all of their lives trying to work for their salvation, but we have to accept it as a free gift from God. But there was more going on here. Jesus was Mary's firstborn son, and Mary and Joseph were very poor, hence um, they'd been bo Jesus being born in the stable. And they could only offer a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons as a sacrifice instead of a lamb. And this was to fill the lawful requirement we read about in verse 24. Now the pair of birds to be sacrificed were a sin offering. And this might seem strange to us as the baby Jesus was without sin. And only someone who was without sin could save his people. Jesus was without sin, but he was prepared to be born under the law and to identify with us sinful creatures, and later become sin itself to pay the guilt price on our behalf. And what condescension, excuse me, condescension we see here, a very personal saviour who loves us so much that he's prepared to take on our human form and identify with us sinners. Isn't that amazing? that he's prepared to do that. Imagine the creator of everything humbles himself so low on our behalf. And it reminds me of that hymn, hands that flung stars into space to cruel nails surrender. What a condescending God we have. But what a dedication and sacrifice this was going to be. Jesus would be completely obedient to doing the will of his heavenly father. He would be the great high priest offering the perfect once and for all sacrifice that would redeem mankind. So the dedication of baby Jesus was the reason they were all in the temple that day and the stage was set for Mary and Joseph's encounter with this man Simeon and Simeon's encounter with the saviour of the world. So let's have a look at the person of Simeon and read about him in verses 25 to 28. Now, there's four Simeons mentioned in the Bible. 
Simeon, a son of Jacob, in Genesis 29, verse 33. Simeon, a church member of the church in Antioch, and we read about that in Acts 13, verse 1. Simeon, who was uh, listed in the lineage of Jesus in Luke 3, verse 30, and the Simeon we're looking at today, who met the baby Jesus at the time of his presentation in the temple. The name Simeon means God has heard. Now, we assume Simeon to be an old man, perhaps because he was prepared um, to die after seeing Jesus, but I cannot really find anything in the text that tells us he was old, but a lot of people seem to think that he was old. But you might say that this Simeon was a bit of a mystery. He just appears in verse 25. Now, the temple at that time would have been full of people. There may have been other dedications go on, going on. People would be praying and the baby Jesus would just be any baby in the crowd. It would be a normal day or business as usual in the temple. But one man in the crowd did know who this child was because it was revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. So this was not a chance encounter. God was working out his salvation plan. And I think there's so much we can learn from Simeon. So let's have a look at five things about him that we know about from these verses. Well, the first one was he was righteous and devout. Secondly, he was waiting and witnessing. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit was upon him and led him. Fourthly, he was hoping. And fifthly, he embraced Jesus. So let's have a look at his righteousness and how he was devout in verse 25. As we mentioned earlier, these were dark days spiritually. And Simeon serves as an example to us as how, how to live an upright and godly, and godly life in the midst of darkness and in a, in the world that is counter and in, a, and in a world that is countercultural to the word of god and we live in that um, world today don't we simeon would stand out from other jews who, who had abandoned living a godly life being righteous and devout means to me that simeon had a relationship with his god this was not blind obedience he was trusting in god so we know he was a deeply faithful man, but there's nothing in the text to suggest he was a prophet or a priest. To me, he's just an ordinary man, and we can identify with Simeon. We're just like a Simeon today, as we, we are part of a faithful remnant waiting for our Lord's return. We too can be like Simeon as we strive to live out godly lives in a corrupt and wicked generation. How do we live out our lives before our neighbours, and how do we do it? in the workplace. We can be like Simeon and not let the world corrupt us. Simeon also uses the word Lord in verse 29, um, which indicates he acknowledges God's sovereignty, sovereignty in his life, meaning that he has a very high view of God and a very low view of himself. I wonder this morning, are we prepared to be a slave to Jesus? Is he Lord over our lives and not Lord in our lives among with many other lords? Being righteous does not mean we look down on others as if we're better, better than them. But Simeon had a humble and contrite heart. And we read in Psalm 51 verse 17, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. So we also see how Simeon seemed to be at peace and satisfied to wait for the consolation of Israel in verse 25. And this speaks to me as someone who has a rock steady, quiet faith, trusting in his Lord and humility as he does it, not in his own strength, but he relies upon the Lord. And I think in this day and age, the overarching longing for every one of us is to be at peace and satisfied. And don't we spend our lives looking for this in all the wrong places, looking to power or wealth or possessions, and we end up being totally unfulfilled in life, craving for this, that and the other, while still feeling completely empty and alone. Simeon was not like this. He was at peace and content. And we can sometimes get um, embroiled in the world, can't we, chasing after this and chasing after that, instead of looking towards our Lord Jesus. Secondly, Simeon was waiting and witnessing, and we read about this in verse 25 again, Simeon was waiting for the consolation of Israel, that is, for the Messiah, our comforter. 
Isaiah 40 verse 2 says, Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. Now, this may not have been the consolation that many would have thought of. Instead, perhaps they were looking for someone to bring political and national freedom from Rome. The fact that Simeon was waiting could also indicate that in that day there was only a small remnant of faithful godly people waiting patiently for the Messiah, just like us today, waiting patiently for our Lord to return. So are we like Simeon, actively waiting and praying? Are we walking with the Lord or are we busy chasing after the world? Or are we just treading water in our, in our spiritual life? Are we just waiting and not knowing what to do are we active Simeon was longing to see the fulfillment of the promises of God waiting patiently for his Messiah but as he was waiting he was living a holy life in a very dark period of spiritual drought he wasn't just waiting he was trusting God in our day and age waiting is not something we like to do is it um, life's to be lived at a rapid pace and we want instant gratification we want it now but God wants faithful people like Simeon who are fulfilled in him. Just as that Simeon was waiting for the Messiah, we need to be waiting today patiently for our Lord's return. But while we're waiting, we need to be living out godly lives in our communities. Um, and are we part of a small remnant of God's faithful people today? Sometimes it can be very oppressive, can't it, when we're you know, there's not many of us come to church on a Sunday anymore and we see the whole of the nation turning away. And one thing that struck, struck me, Simeon was longing. Are we longing for the Lord's return? He was longing to see his Messiah. So are our daily lives lived longing for the return of our Lord? Simeon witnessed to others by his godly life. And even though the times were dark, um, God had his people in all the right places, just like he has today. And we have been placed by God in the communities where we live to witness to others, to unbelievers. But our faith can't just be a passive faith, can it? If we're truly saved, we're truly the Lord's, it must be evident by the works that we do. God's spirit must be working out in our lives. And it must be tangible to unbelievers. In other words, those we rub shoulders with in our workplace and in our communities, they must be able to see some evidence of our faith in the way we love and care for each other. Not just our fellow Christians, um, but to our neighbours. Remember, the second commandment is to love our neighbours as ourselves. And I'm not really into politics, as you well know, but it was really refreshing to hear Boris Johnson quote that in one of his addresses, that we should love our neighbour as ourselves. I guess it was in relation to everybody having their booster jab or their first inoculations. But, you know, here was the Prime Minister quoting scripture. Amazing thing in this day and age. So living a godly life in a dark age can also bring opposition to us as people around us might not like what they see in us because it could be countercultural. It's going against the tide. It may even show them up in a bad light. We, not, may not, we may not fit in with the prevailing society norms. Um, it can be hard to stand out. And remember our Lord Jesus Christ suddenly st uh, certainly stood out and was persecuted for it. So we need to be realistic, don't we? You know that following Jesus might cost us friends, promotion at work, possessions, or even family members. But the eternal rewards will be worth it. Simeon could see the reward Simeon was not looking at the here and now, but to the future of seeing his Messiah. And are we living lives like that, longing for our Lord's return? The third thing we notice about Simeon was that the Holy Spirit was upon him. And indeed, the Holy Spirit led him. So Simeon was under the power and influence of the Holy Spirit as he yielded and was obedient to the word of God. And this tells me that he was willing to be used by God. And this is a challenge, isn't it, for all of us who profess to be Christians. We long to be spirit-filled and see God working in and through our lives. You know, we often pray for that in our prayer meeting. But does our longing go far enough to let him have real control and to be led to the places we don't want to be led to? 
Look at the supreme example of Jesus who prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane for the cup of the cross to be taken away from him. But he yielded to the will of his father. So Simeon resisted temptation of the spiritual darkness around him and he looked to God. In some way, in the same way, we need to resist the temptation of our culture today and we can all think of the immense pressure being a Christian in today's life is. But it was no different for Simeon. There were pressures upon him. We need to live out and stand up for God and we should not be followers of the flesh but of the spirit. And our blessing is not just in the hearing, here and now, but in eternity. We've got a hope. If we do not want to be used by God, then how can we be blessed by God? If we resist and we disobey him. We long to be used and we long to be blessed and have a close fellowship with our God. But the only way we'll do that is by being obedient. And how often, as I've said earlier, do we pray to be led by the Spirit? So what does this mean? Well, Simeon had a close walk with the Lord and he, had, he submitted to God. And the text tells us that the Spirit led him to the temple on this day. And it reminds me of the Apostle John, who was led in the Spirit and taken to the island of Pathmos. Simeon was not led by the sensual nature of the world, but he could have succumbed at any time to his senses and absorbed the spiritual darkness that was all around him. He could have absorbed all the problems and concerns of the day, the prevailing culture, if you like, the ideology, ideologies and thinking of the day. But no, Simeon was under the power and influence of the Holy Spirit as he trusted God. Do you find your close walk with the Lord is marred and tainted as you turn your eyes away from Jesus and get embroiled in the worldly things? So to be led by the Spirit means for us that we must have a com close communion with Jesus. He must be truly Lord and centre of our lives. And fourthly, Simeon had hope, in, and read about this in verse 26. Do we have hope? Are we standing on the promises of God? Simeon, Simeon had been promised that he would not taste death until he had seen the Messiah. Simeon held on to his hope even in the midst of an ungodly generation. He had faith, didn't he? And he trusted in his God. But sometimes we get disappointed at the world around us as we seem to be going against the flow. But we need to remember God's spirit is with us. We need to remember that. We sometimes forget, don't we? And we can overcome the world in his strength. Our hope is not for this world, but for eternity to come. This world will pass away and we'll all die. But our hope remains in Jesus. He's the author of this world. He's the, he's the creator and sustainer of this world we live in. We can trust and hope in him because he has overcome death on our behalf at Calvary. We can trust Jesus. We can have hope in him. And fifthly, Simeon embraced Jesus. We read about this in verse 28. And we see here the culmination of all this waiting and walking closely with the Lord and trusting in his promises. Simeon meets his saviour at last. Amazing, isn't it? That he was given this promise years before and he's been faithfully waiting for it to happen and at last the day comes. And the day will come for our Lord's return. Are we ready for it like Simeon was? Even more, he's allowed to hold the baby Jesus in his arms. Imagine the privilege of embracing baby Jesus, the creator and saviour of the world, the king of kings and the lord of lords. Imagine holding this baby in his arms. What a privilege. And we get the picture, uh, the picture here that this was the whole purpose of Simeon's life. He didn't need anything else. He'd been totally fulfilled. So the question for us this morning is, do we really embrace Jesus? Is he the purpose and centre of our lives? There is so much, isn't there, that we can learn from Simeon. But sometimes instead of embracing this baby Jesus, we want to hold him at arm's length, don't we? We don't want him to interfere personally in our lives. But Simeon ran to Jesus and embraced him, just like the father in the par parable of the prodigal son. When the son returned, he saw him from a distance and he ran to him and embraced him. Do we run to Jesus? Do we embrace him? Is he Lord of our lives? Easy things that are said from the pulpit, but so much harder to work out in our daily lives, aren't they? 
So let's look at Simeon's blessing, the third point this morning. And we read about that in verses 28 to 32. As Simeon embraces Jesus, he blesses him. He blesses God and he can truly say that he can now die in peace because he has seen and held the salvation for mankind. He's held the baby Jesus. Likewise, we must be prepared for our departure from this world and we spend our lives um, deceiving ourselves. You know, we think we're not going to die. We, it's not going to happen yet. It's not going to happen yet. But we don't know the time. And, you know, our departure, we need to be preparing for our departure, don't we? By deciding what we are to do with the baby Jesus. But not just the baby Jesus, the Jesus who was crucified on the cross at Calvary. What are we going to do with him? And we've, we're only given two choices, don't, haven't we? We either embrace him like Simeon or we do nothing and reject him. There's only two choices. It's amazing the way God's word, word leaves it like that. If, you're in what, if you, you can't be in both camps, you've got to make a decision for the Lord Jesus Christ. But God is very gracious to us, isn't he? Given us the time on this earth to get right with him. And we might think we're here on earth for our pleasure and to do um, all the things we want to do, to have all the aspirations fulfilled that we have in our lives, to have our bucket lists, etc., etc. But God has his own purpose in that we're not ready to die until we embrace Jesus. That's the purpose of our life, to glorify God and this condescension we see again of God giving us a chance to get right with him. Again, what a condescending and compassionate God we have. God had kept his promises to faithful Simeon, but moreover, this plan of salvation had been worked out before the creation of the world. And it had been prepared beforehand, and the whole of the Old Testament points to the Messiah. But even though God had chosen Israel as the means to do this, his plan was even greater than this, and we thank him that it is. The coming redemption was for the whole world, not for the Jews, but for the Gentile as well, even you and me this morning. And in Isaiah 49, chapter 6, we read these words. It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. And in chapter 52 of the same book, verses 10, Verse 10, the Lord has borne his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of God. Amazing words. And, and that will happen. We've got faith and trust in our Lord that that will happen. So fourthly, what did Simeon say to Mary and Joseph in verses 33 to 35? Well, Mary and Joseph had marveled at the prophetic things that Simeon had said about their child in verses 30 to 32, about him being the saviour to both Jew and Gentile. But there was more to come. But this time, not what they have, may have been waiting to hear. And it's interesting, isn't it, that before Simeon tells them about the rest of the news, he blesses them. And in my mind, perhaps it's in preparation for the words that he was about to say. And if you like, he builds them up because of what he's going to say next. So Mary and Joseph must have been overjoyed. They must have been elated. Simeon had confirmed to them what God had already revealed to them. It was no longer a secret, only known to Mary and Joseph. But there was a thorn in the flesh to come. And this was aimed at Mary and the worst news any mother could receive about their son. These verses are very sobering because they tell us that there will be a cost to following Jesus. Verse 33 amazes Mary and Joseph, being told that their child was going to be the saviour of the whole world. But now there's a mood change, if you like. This is, this is often referred to as the Song of Simeon, and, and like a musical piece, there is a mood change here. Because he would become, because he would cause some to rise and some to fall. And this means to me that the effect Jesus has on us personally and our attitude towards him, that this affects our eternal destination. Those who accept him would rise and enter the kingdom, but those who reject him would fall to their own eternal destiny without Christ. We are under no illusion here, and the, the words 
put the ball firmly in our court. It's our choice what we do with Jesus. And we sometimes use the analogy, don't we, of Jesus being the cornerstone or foundation stone on which to build our lives. Those who accept him will be elevated and build up and rise to the kingdom. But those who reject him, he's a stumbling stone or, or a rock of offence, it's called in some, in some commentaries. And some will be brought low and the judgment of this cornerstone will fall upon them. But here there's a double whammy for Mary, isn't there? Simeon tells her that although her son is the light and saviour of the world, his life and death on this earth would be like a sword. It would pierce her soul. And I think for Mary this means the pain and anguish of seeing her son despised and rejected by those he came to save and crucified on a Roman cross. And not only, and he wouldn't be the one that would save them from the oppression of Rome. There was a lot of people thinking a Messiah was going to save them from the Roman Empire. So Mary has, has been dealt this blow. A sword would pierce a soul. In verse 35, it says that Mary's soul would be pierced so that the thoughts of many hearts might be revealed. And I wonder this morning, have you ever realised that this indeed is personal? It really is personal. And Jesus died for your sin. And when I look back on my life, it was my sin that nailed Jesus to the, to the cross and Jesus, at the time of my, of, of, my, of my being saved, revealed the thoughts of my heart. Because that's what Jesus does. He reveals the thoughts of your heart. And I saw my sin for what it was. And I saw the Lord Jesus dying on the cross to, to pay the price for my sin. My sin was put upon him. And for the first time in my life, I saw my sin as it really was and what it cost him. And I saw... The thoughts of my heart the thoughts of my heart were deeply wicked and i was convicted at that time and i was convicted so much so that i wanted to follow the lord jesus christ so as jesus this morning sheds his light on your heart as you consider these things what will that light reveal to you this morning will it convict you of your sins or will you leave this place will you leave this live stream still in your sin still not having bowed the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. So just in conclusion, we're going to look at a, a few applications, some bullet points from what we've uh, read today. So overall, I think the whole point of these verses uh, leads us to the fact that we need to rely on Jesus entirely, not just for our salvation now, but for our eternal peace and security in the future. Jesus Christ is our only hope the world is going to let us down. And we've seen the events of this year, how the world has just not known how to cope with things. But we can put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We can't rely on our politicians. We can't rely on our leaders. We need to turn to Jesus. Another point, Simeon was a righteous and devout man and an example to us all, wasn't he? We should follow his example and live out our lives in the way Simeon did even though the world is a very dark place, just as it was in Simeon's day. And we need to persevere in our faith, don't we? Even though we feel we're swimming against the tide, but we need to not be under any illusion. It will be hard work for us at times. Are we like Simeon, wait, waiting for the return of our Lord? The, consul, the consul, consolation we're looking for is when our Lord returns, and he will put right everything. Everything will be at perfect harmony, there will be peace and justice will be done at last. You know, when the Lord comes again, it's not going to be as a, a humble baby in a manger. He's going to come with power and glory and justice will be done at last. All, all wrongs will be righted. But where are we going to be? Are we going to be with him or are we going to win a lost eternity? Justice will be done at last and all God's children will be gathered in. Those who... God has purpose before time began. That would be uh, the bride of Christ. They will be gathered in. That is a promise. And you know, where are we this morning? Are we part of that bride? Another application for us is that we need to trust Jesus and trust he will lead us. Uh, he will lead us to live lives that are obedient to him, just like Simeon did. Waiting and witnessing in anticipation of his return. 
but we all have work to do in service to our Lord. For some, it might be great things, um, leading churches, preaching, um, you know, missionary work. But for others, it might just be simple things, living out a faithful witness in our community, not being shy to let people know we stand on the Lord Jesus Christ and on his promises. Sometimes we can live lives, we shy away and we hide and we don't say a word for the Lord. It may be we've only got a few conversations to be had in our lifetime, but are we willing to be used and are we willing to speak and walk the talk for our Lord? And if we are resting in Jesus, we will feel the power of his spirit working in our lives. But we need to allow that spirit to work, don't we? Not to hinder it. Um, we need God's spirit to permeate our lives and work in and through us. Don't keep him at arm's length. Embrace Jesus and let his spirit work within us. So if you've not bowed the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ yet, then why not? Um, are you ready to die? Are you ready to confess him as Lord and saviour your, your, of your life? Remember, he's given us this time on earth to acknowledge him. The very reason we are here and now is to give us time to do this. Don't put it off. You know, we all, we're all very good at putting things off. We never get to the end result, do we? But with Jesus, we either accept or reject him. And are we ready to die knowing Jesus? Or has that not happened? Are you going to die without knowing the Lord Jesus? We never know the time of our death, do we? But ultimately, there will be a cost of following Jesus in this life. We may experience persecution. We may be ostracised in society. We may, may suffer financially. But there will be no cost to us in eternity. The price has been paid as we enjoy all the benefits of being in paradise forever. Remember, forever it goes on and on and on. We will be at peace and contentment forever with our Lord and Master. So this Christmas, I pray that Jesus will reveal the thoughts of your heart at this time. We're going to sing our final hymn now, which is number 162.
Let's pray. So let us uh, learn how to serve and in our lives enthrone him, each other's needs to prefer, for it is Christ worth serving. Father God, we do thank you for your words to us this morning and we pray that those words might become alive in our daily lives. Father God, would you lead us in these days in the coming weeks to be more like your servant Simeon, to wait and rest upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Father God, would you do us good? Shall we save the grace together? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.